Hi, this is Shantae from Parenting Special Needs Magazine. In today's live show, we will be talking with Cheryl Albright. Cheryl has contributed an article in our current issue titled, I am the ghost of your future. A letter to special needs parents from a neurotypical sibling. Cheryl recently had to become guardian of her brother as well as move him during the pandemic from one state to another while taking care of her father juggling work. Uh, she has a very important message to share with all of us. Please welcome Cheryl Albright. I was very excited to have Cheryl. I was glad we were able to share her uh, article because I think what she says is so very important for parents to hear. Cheryl, please um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, yeah, my name is Cheryl Albright. I uh, currently reside in Bradenton, Florida, which is about an hour south of Tampa, but originally from upstate New York, uh, closer to Canada than the city, and currently working as an occupational therapist and yoga therapist in private practice. So I'm coming to you from my office this afternoon. And I have an older sibling on the autism spectrum and the more severe, he doesn't use verbal language. I know nonverbal is a term we're not using anymore, which is hard for me not to, but he doesn't currently have any verbal language. Uh, will use an iPad occasionally and has some signs just to get basic needs across. And recently just got him and my father down here. So kind of an interesting. <laughs> So your article, that for those that have not read it, it is in the current issue, so they can, but um, basically tell us a little bit about the backstory of what, what happened or um, what, what prompted you to write that article. So a few years ago, I had mentioned something to my father about having, you know, what's the plan? It's like, what is the plan when, you know, and he was in his 60s and didn't want to talk about it. And I'm like, well, we have to have these conversations, right? And like what's gonna happen with my brother? I'm not moving back to Western New York. I'm not paying the taxes and I'm not shoveling the snow. That's just, we're done with that. And so it was kind of like, okay, like is there a special needs trust? What's in the will? What is the plan? And he would just shut down and would not talk about it. So then um, I get a phone call somewhat out of the blue about this is January 2019, that he wasn't, he said he wasn't feeling well. I had talked to him earlier in the day. He said the on-call physician said to go to the emergency room. And I get a phone call from another family member saying, oh, they're just going to keep him overnight for observation. And my gut said, hmm, something, something's not right. So when I called and talked to the actual hospital and talked to the nurse practitioner, he had three organs going into failure and that I needed to have his arrangements in order. So I got on the first plane I could out of Tampa, and um, but I didn't know where to start. So I just kind of went to the hospital and was like, what do, I, what do I need to do? He was kind of in and out of consciousness at this point. And the social worker is asking for his, are you his healthcare proxy? And I was like, I don't know. I had no idea where any of this paperwork was. I had a feeling it was this power of attorney. I vaguely remember signing something years ago. And, but I didn't know where these documents were. And this was your I, father, right? This was your mm -hmm. father, not your sibling. Okay. Yeah. And we haven't even gotten to the sibling part. So nothing had been done. The whole point was they're telling me to plan his funeral and nothing is prepared for my sibling. So the guardianship hadn't been filed. My father had been guardian his legal guardian forever. And I was pushing for co-guardian probably six months prior to that. I said, just have me on there just in case. And then we don't have to, which is kind of a, a weird scenario. People usually don't do that. Usually just have the sibling as kind of a backup. Right. But that also requires another court hearing to then become the guardian. So we were trying to avoid that with the distance. So not everybody does it that way. And most of the time, they don't like to have two guardians like that. But in this case, since I lived 2,200 miles away, it just kind of made more sense. I luckily have a cousin who worked in the law firm that all of these documents were 
um, originally filed and she was able to obtain everything and anything that I needed to do, plus push the attorneys to file for a petition for me to become co-guardian while he was in the hospital. So we kind of went through this journey of back and forth from hospital to rehab to then eventually hospice and now living that. And it just, it, it just kept going. And I was like, plan funeral, now we're doing okay. So it kind of went back and forth for about nine months. And so then I moved my father to be here closer so I didn't have to keep the, every time they're like, oh, it's time and getting on a plane. Me and Southwest got a little too cozy. So <laughs> I was <laughs> just kind of done with the airports and airplanes and everything else. So we moved him first because it was less of a orchestration to get him moved. And then we moved my brother in, Mar <laughs> in the peak of the pandemic, which I'm sure we'll get to. <laughs> um, wow and the pandemic and how I got through all of that. So this letter comes from a place of, please just have a plan. <laughs> have a plan. And talk about it with your um, siblings or your typical um, children so that they know. And I have to be honest and transparent. You know, your letter really resonated with me because although I'm a huge advocate for all of this, um, I have to raise my hand. I have not done it yet. We haven't. We've talked, I know, so look at that face. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I know, but there's no excuse. And I keep saying, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. But just like what happened to you, we never know. Um, and, and so I was talking to my daughter the other night and I said, you know, that I was going to get, um, interview you. And, um, and she's like, she's like, but you have that stuff done, don't you? <laughs> no, kiddo, I don't. So that's why it's very important. Like, you know, yes, uh, we need to have everything in order because there's just so much, but you know, where would you start? What, what did you start with? Like you, thank goodness you had a lawyer, um, family, friend, but like, what if you don't? Right. So it was, and <laughs> point of crisis, at least I had points of contact where I could at least call. Like I knew my father had an attorney somewhere. I knew that he had a financial planner somewhere, like, but I didn't know necessarily who all these people were, where their phone numbers. I just had to, it was like a hunt. It was like a scavenger hunt in his home to try to find all of these things. So that part was not so much fun. Uh, I So all of these are legal documents, right? So you, the power of attorney, healthcare, it's called something different in Florida, healthcare surrogate maybe. Yeah. Um, so same equivalent though. If there's any kind of special needs trust, if the sibling needs guardianship and it's a little different in the state of Florida because I just went through the process with between guardian and guardian advocate and any of those legal documents have to start from an attorney and I know it's not cheap right. and I understand that and I I know legal aid will help you if you financially qualify for like the will and the power of attorney and things like that they will not touch guardianship because it's just um to I don't I I couldn't do it on my own I did not under there is a huge difference between the state of Florida and the state of New York and so, I think they're different in every state. That's the problem too, you know, is they're all different. So, I mean, the judge was like, oh, okay, you were the guardian before and now you're here and I need these pe these pieces of paper and it, it went okay. But it was definitely, if I had to start from scratch, I, the thing is like, you know, so now like me and my husband have to redo some of our documents too, because, you know, when you have guardian and that kind of like, we have to shift things around so that he doesn't accidentally get left money or anything like that and disturb his um, SSI. Yeah, SSI. So, yeah. <laughs> start with an attorney or start with another special needs parent who's already kind of gone with it. I know some of the organization, local organizations will help out. Like one family said, I know here locally we have Manasota Buds, which is bringing up Down syndrome, and they have a scholarship just to help you with that yeah. process. Um, so some of the autism support groups may have something if they don't, uh, the, they all need to start because, you know, we're, these individuals are becoming adults and they're outliving right. their parents, yes. which is not something that happened even, you know, 50 years ago. So it wasn't as much of an issue as it is today. Right. Um, so see, I just say, seek out legal counsel, seek out parents that have already done it, support groups, this, you know, 
maybe that's something your magazine can, I don't know, but just having um, other people that have kind of walked the walk right. it. I took it upon myself to educate myself what the government funding was like for the sibling here in Florida, what, what needs to happen. Uh, Easter Seals had a night where an attorney came and talked and I went and frantically took notes. And this was maybe two years prior to this incident happening. So I kind of educated myself on what would need to happen for him. Right. But and what would you so when you had to move your brother and everything how um, and I know that in the article you mentioned I mean you have a full you have your own job your I mean your own business and lots of stuff so you had to be put on hold trying to do all this and it wasn't necessarily even just taking care of your father it was also taking care of your brother and getting all this established right so how long did all of that take you so yeah the planning part took about six to seven months. So trying to figure out who is going to take care of my father during the process. Uh, luckily, we found something called a geriatric case manager. Once again, these people are not cheap, but I had to still be able to work and work in my business and on my business. And if I go home and he's there, I have to take care of his needs. So it was just, she kind of helped orchestrate some of that kind of stuff. and taking off for doctor's appointments and it just got to be a lot. So we found a place for him to go for a respite. As far as my brother goes, it was like transportation. Like how are, there are so many different <laughs> facets to that. It was like, how are we physically going to get him here? Right. And then we'll worry about APD and everybody else later. But it was like the physical is like, do we, do we tempt fate in a vehicle? Like, do we, <laughs> like, are we going to go 2,200 miles in a car? Or, or an RV was their backup plan. Um, like rent one of those Cruise Americas and drive them down. We ultimately ended up going with uh, Flying Angels, which is a flying nurse service. So they were able to administer a mild sedative. So he wasn't as anxious. He actually ended up loving the airplane. Like who knew? He'd never been on one. He was looking out the window, looking over at me and my husband, looking out the window like this is so cool. Like his eyes were wide the entire time, but he was calm as a cucumber. And I was just like, okay. Like I was not expecting him to be that calm in an airport. Um, and he did phenomenal. And I didn't even know that the Flying Angels would take, um, I thought that it was only like children that were going for surgery or something like that. So that's interesting. Well, there's Angel Flight, which is, something different than flying angels, okay. <laughs> which I got okay. thoroughly confused. So angel flight is what you're thinking of. That's like a very minimal charge to get from like point A to point B for those kind of medical procedures. What I found out with them is they have to change planes every 300 nautical miles. So this would have taken all day. And if the pilot at all felt threatened, he would ground the plane. Hmm. So I was like, so it's going to be this little puddle jumper with just me and my brother and a pilot with no extra support. And I was just like, yeah, no, we're not. No, mm -mm. we're going to roll the dice with a commercial airline. Either it'll be a great PR stunt or a poor one. <laughs> right. But, so I was like, what do we do? So kudos American Airlines for that. Um, it was a fraction of what, because I was like, well, how much does it cost to like rent out a plane for a day? I don't know. Like I, cause I just didn't know how we were like, I just gonna didn't do it. Wow. Point a to point B. We'll deal with everything else later. Right. But Flying angels was perfect. So. Oh, that, that's great to hear. So that's wonderful. So now behaviors, as far as emotions, because you had obviously tons of emotions going on and how <laughs> were, how were his emotions or how were you handling his and yours? Um, how did you handle everything? Um, it was interesting. Because change is not easy. <laughs> Transition is not easy. Not easy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Especially our, um, our, our children or our siblings. I think by the time I had to deal with him, I was just numb to all the changes <laughs> anyway, that it was just kind of like, let's go. Um, between my father and transitions and everything else, it was just kind of like, all right, this is the, this is the last step. We got this. <laughs> it was just kind of full steam ahead. He, so we got him here literally the next morning to the DMV, get the picture ID so I can submit the rest of it to APD, which is the Agency for Persons with Disabilities, to get him um, 
we actually ended up going with an ICF because when we got him here, it was the second week of March and APD had closed admissions to group homes because of COVID. Right. So our only choice was um, an intermediate care facility, which is turning out to be a great placement for him, don't get me wrong. Um, it's a small house in a residential neighborhood. You wouldn't know it's a group home. It, 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 it turned out to be, it worked out well, but we still had to go through the Agency for Persons with Disabilities to prove that he did have a qualifying diagnosis for that, get approval for that, and then it simultaneously getting Medicaid to say, yes, he needs that kind of facility. So it was just kind of knowing how to navigate all these systems. And, um, and are you a little bit, would you say you're a little bit more familiar because you're at least in the business in a sense? Because I mean, yeah. some of these things you're saying, like I haven't heard of that acronym for that, um, facility so you know I'm kind of in the business too but you know I haven't been looking like that but I mean parents wouldn't even know to ask for these things I mean maybe you have more connections but I mean so funny enough, you talk about connections it's networking 101 right like I I speak every year at family cafe I'm the one that teaches all the yoga classes in the morning so I was familiar with some of the people within agency for persons with disabilities okay. And I would, last year I gave a presentation on childhood trauma and intellectual disability and um, trauma-informed care. And it, somebody from APD happened to be in there. So I made sure to get his business card. <laughs> yes, yeah. Okay. So I did have a kind of like, and so, you know, I sit on a developmental disability councils here and I communicated a little bit throughout the year. Hey, we need numbers for this. What are your updated numbers for wait lists or people that are waiting in our area for services and things like that. So when I sent the email that said crisis in caps letters, he directed me right to the person that I needed to do um, and who I needed to talk to. And so wait, repeat that again, because that was a key. You sent a letter and said crisis in, key in letters, capital letters. In capital letters. Okay, so that is like a key for people that are listening. Like that crisis, capital letters gets attention. It does. And so there is a, there is a way to, because everybody talks about the wait list and the inflated numbers. And in the state, I think it's 20, I don't remember the last, 26,000 are waiting. And the thing, the thing was like, we could qualify for crisis because I was taking care of my, so everybody that's listening, pay attention to that website and what qualifies for crisis. And we hit most of those boxes. So taking care of an elderly parent um, over the age of 70, like there was a few, he would be homeless. Like I can't take care of his needs 24 seven. And so if we weren't able to work, what would that look like? And then if there's no income, then none of us would be having a roof. So there was easy, it was, I don't wanna say easy, but since we weren't asking APD for funding, it went through a little bit quicker. We would just need to say that he would qualify for funding if we needed it. ICFs do have a bad rap because um, they fall under the same category as like a Medicaid nursing home. Okay. But the ones that are oversought by the Agency for Disabil Persons with Disabilities, um, this one seemed is so far so good. He, uh, I mean, so I had a lot of complaints with the state of New York. So this is by far much smoother. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So what would you, um, what would you say to parents? Like, what would you now say having to have dealt with this? What would you really want parents to get across I mean, to them? My questions would be, you know, can your adult child up and leave for three months to take care of your needs? Probably not. Right. So depending on where they are in the country, even if they are close by, could somebody take off, like manage a full-time job and the parent, we're not even talking about the sibling yet. Right. So just like the parents needs, right? So if you were to become ill tomorrow and require that much attention and you've done no planning and have a house that needs to be emptied and sold and like all of those things, you know? Right, they take a lot for a typical sibling, I mean, typical children to do for their parents. It's a lot, right? Right. So we, we haven't even brought in the sibling piece yet, right? So think of all the things that would have to be done and can that individual afford to leave their job for that long? Would their employer be that supportive? Like I, like I said, I was lucky I own my own business. I pushed everything off on contractors that I could and I took off. 
And most of my families, they're special needs families. So they were like, oh yeah, take as much you time as you need. Right. You know, they were, <laughs> and then they were watching like hawks. <laughs> yeah, like, what did you do? How'd you do it? Yes. <laughs> like, <laughs> help me out with this process. And I can tell you that most of my clients since then have gotten their ducks in a row. <laughs> so at least we taught them something. And then you're talking about the sibling and where they're going to be. And not all neurotypical siblings want the responsibility and that's okay. Right. But have those conversations before it's crisis mode. Right. And I think that is a key message or that parents need to take away and even siblings that have those conversations. Make sure you know where the documents are. Make sure it, it has the process started. Are there you know documents in place? Because um, I've done an interview before with another mother, and that's what she said. She she helped someone, a husband that had lost his uh, wife from Alzheimer's, and you know, he she was trying to help him, and paperwork was nowhere. No one knew how to find anything. It took them weeks to find, you know, stuff, and she was going through it, you know. So it's you got to have stuff in a, in an order so that people can put their hands on it, and people need to know where it's at because, right. you know, crisis happened. Right. So. I think that's huge as well. So what would be your, um, so I think that's a great tip too, right? Is start the conversation. Second, have your ducks in a row. Um, you know, probably stay organized. <laughs> it's another one. Just, like. have it, just have it in one spot. Cause like, I can tell you all these documents were scattered around my father's house. Don't do that. Just to have them in one spot where somebody knows where they are. Like it didn't make any sense for the will to be in one spot and the power of attorney was somewhere else and it was on a different bookshelf. And I was like, why is it on a bookshelf and not like in a, like just have in case of emergency, here's a folder. And that's kind of another point too, is the sooner you can get a sibling involved, either through the care plan meetings or even younger, like I would have, he, he's pre, prior to IDA. So there wasn't really IEP meetings, but if a sibling does, especially an older sibling does have an opportunity to go to an IEP meeting and see what advocacy looks like and see, mm -hmm. you know, have it modeled um, and kind of know kind of what you're going to be up against. And so that doesn't change when they become adults and depending on the state and depending on what facility, if they're in a facility, how many, like what those meetings look like, who are the players, who are the, you know, I took it upon myself to interject, but I mean, a lot of siblings don't, or don't. they don't know how. Or they don't know that they're supposed to, you know. Or or... Right. I, I just kind of, and I'm, Part of it is I'm, I work in the field, so all of us that have become OTs, PTs, speech, BCBAs, more letters, right? <laughs> we become the alphabet soup, and you know we kind of are a little bit more aware because we see it. Right. But if you work in, you know, I know a sibling who he's a financial planner, so he would know the financial side and kind of right. maybe know some legal stuff, but he might not know the direct care side of things. So. Right. No, I hear you. And I also got to interview um, several years ago, uh, Don Meyer, he runs oh. the SIP shops. Yeah. And, uh, and he made some valid points too, that um, siblings are too important to ignore because they, they know our children the longest because parents do, you know, they're in their, they're involved with our, with our children the longest. They have the longest relationship so we can't ignore them. We need to include them and make sure that they're aware of, of things that their siblings need, you know, or to how to take care of them in the paperwork and all that kind of stuff, because right. they're going to be with them longer than, the, than we are. So. Well, I would, yeah, I would encourage the siblings that are listening to us or the parents that could get the siblings. He did start Sidna on Facebook and that support group is up to almost like 5,000 people now and hugely beneficial going through all of this and I know I've invited I don't know how many people now but you know that there is something out there there is something you can join to bounce ideas off of uh, Florida has the Florida Sibling Alliance not quite as active as SIBDAT but I've met a lot of great people through that too so and is it SIBNET or SIBDOT which it's SIBNET SIBNET is SIBNET um, Don on Facebook. right yeah. okay so Don moderates that one and there's a teenage group I believe too. Yeah, I think I've heard about that too. He moderates with a social worker, so it's safe for teens and moderated by an adult. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's, you know, that caveat. But yeah, the SIB 
Same now, and there's no, I got to go to the sibling leadership conference last year and I got to, Don Meyer was the keynoter. Um, so I got, I didn't even know he existed or any of the sibling stuff existed until then. And, you know, I was just like in the midst of all this chaos, it comes across my Facebook feed. My husband was like, just go, you live on an airplane anyway, just, just go to the conference and met tons of people from all over the world in the same boat and no story was too crazy. And so hopefully, you know, I was in, of course I was in the midst of chaos. So I'm like, have a plan, <laughs> yeah. but um, yeah, hopefully it got people talking. That's for sure. Well, and I, I want to just point out too, for anybody that's listening to that has younger children, it's not just for older children. I know I first heard about sip shops when my, um, when my children were like, you know, 10 and eight, you know, and oh. it was all, yes, but I've never heard of it since then. I lived in one area where they had a couple of events and then I moved, never heard of, from it again. And people in where I live now, there's never been a sip shop. There's never been anything mm -hmm. that I'm aware of for these, for these parents that are raising children or for the siblings. Cause that's the whole point is to realize that there's other people out there that are feeling like you or don't know how to feel. Or it's funny because I've attracted a lot of siblings as kids, so I have them as clients now where they're starting to see that the siblings need some kind of support too. So the things that I see are like increased anxiety, which the parents will say, well, maybe they have a sensory processing disorder. They have ADHD. They're so like paranoid that there's maybe something going on when it's really just kind of the sibling experience and them not knowing how to communicate, especially right. if it's the older sibling, because they don't have that role model of saying I'm mad or this is how I get attention appropriately because this is how my sibling does it. And so they get kind of, they get kind of worried. So I have a couple, a couple of those where the sibling is maybe more impaired in getting services that say like Easter seals or a bigger outfit. They're coming to me going, what can you do for your child? And I was like, well, it's going to be a lot of like social emotional kind of stuff. And I'm not necessarily a social worker or a licensed mental health counselor, although I rely on them a lot saying they're bringing up these things. Can you guide me in, you know, within my scope of practice, what can I do for these, these kids? I have taken the SIP shop training. Clearly I've had my hands full. So, so I have not, <laughs> I have not right. started anything yet and COVID happened and um, just looking for another organization to maybe combine resources with to do it but yeah no they're they'll get going in this area at some point well and i think you know that's a point too is that you can take the training and bring on them to your local areas is there anything else that you want to share that i didn't ask about or anything that you want to sum it up with i don't think so i mean they the other siblings joke that you know title of my book should be you know how to move your sibling in the middle of a pandemic but <laughs> <laughs> um, that's pretty interesting I mean you know, the <laughs> pandemic in itself is like crazy so yeah oh, you really had it girl how are you taking care of you oh um, so good question so I, I'm actually a yoga therapist too so I get up and do my own thing in the morning and meditation and um, that kind of has to set the day so yeah if you want a therapist that's going to stay sane um and you know, I, in the midst of this, sought out mental health support because I knew that I was gonna need somebody. And my husband has been a complete trooper through the whole thing. So, you know, but I knew I was gonna need an outside ear voice, something in that. And there's not, I wish, I wish there wasn't such a stigma around it, but that's, you know, those are the two big things that I do for myself. Well, and I think that's great. And, you know, kudos that you are taking action because it, you're right. It shouldn't be such a stigma. There's, um, you know, people need help and it's okay to get a sounding board that can, you know, that can help you shift your perspective because I think that's sometimes what it is all about. I, I, I really got an eye opener. I know this is kind of silly even off topic, but Netflix has that show billions and um, the, the lady is like a, um, a counselor to them and she advises them and I'm thinking all she really does is like shift their perspective from this thought to this I mean, we all need those mental counselors you know what I mean I'm thinking I need that every day he gets it you know he's rich he can afford it but I'm like I could use that right we all like wake up one day we're maybe good maybe not you know but anyway so I think kudos. it should be a wellness check just like your physical body gets one I don't understand why we don't all get one once a year anyway right 
because things happen in our life and sometimes you can yeah. go down that rabbit hole and get stuck and like that's the only way to think you know and that's not the only way to, so anyways well i can't thank you enough for sharing with us um i think your message is you know is huge and that parents need to and i am personally i'm listening and i'm going to take action <laughs> I, I've, I've promised myself that we're going to get these things done i did start a binder and i have a few things in place but i don't have the the paperwork and everything and it it needs to happen so um i thank you for sharing with us and getting the message out there because you know it's it's better to be prepared um and to help your um you know your other children that are going to be helping you so absolutely yeah and i started a blog too at specialsib.com so where i kind of just throw out the things that i'm thinking about and so some of that you know, if they're listening and or don't have a copy of the article, it is some of those tips are kind of sprinkled throughout the website, uh, and you know my thoughts on therapy and other other topics. But that's one good good resource out there. Right. So tell me the name again. What it's what's your um, blog? Specialsib.com. Specialsibs.com. Um, mm -hmm. Sib or sibs? Just no s. Sib. Sib. Sib.com. Okay. And then what's the name of your practice? Uh, I sold a soul yoga and all ages therapy services. Wow. So you are busy. Woo. <laughs> three business, three things you're doing. So, well, listen, I can't thank you enough. Thank you for sharing with us, contributing. Thank you for um, getting this message out. Thank you for being a wonderful big sister and taking care of your you know, family. Well, that is huge and not everybody would step up to the plate. So, you know, thank you. And uh, thank you for all that you are doing. And, uh, and I, I look forward to speaking with you again sometime, I hope. Yeah, absolutely.